Uh, can I ask people just to introduce themselves in the chat? I can see that we've got colleagues, physiotherapist Catherine from Maidstone and Tunbridge Wells and a Aidan, undergrad medical student. It's just really helpful for Cathy and I just to know who's joined us. That just helps us in how we present. And it's just nice to meet people from uh, across the region. So I'm just going to share my screen. No, hold on. Sorry, we think you get better at this over time. No, that's still not working. Um, we could see it, Catherine. We just needed to start. Oh right, okay, fine. So, yeah, we could see it perfectly. Thanks. Okay. Okay, right, we're there. All right, is that okay? Perfect. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, so as Claire said, my name's Catherine Evans. I'm a clinical academic. I have a joint post between King's College London and uh, Sussex Community NHS Trust. So I work as a clinical reader and nurse consultant in palliative care. And I thought I'd just use this opportunity just to talk to you about my research journey, just to share with you what I've learned, a lot of the tips picking up on things that, that Cathy has shared, and importantly, uh, the opportunities to pursue research within a clinical career. So I'm just going to give a little outline of my journey, and I'm going to begin from undergraduate right the way through to where I am now. And I'm going to talk a little bit of story of application. So some of my uh, fellowship applications and some of the, uh, the sort of highlights and the dips in that process. And then to just think through some of my top tips and insights. And then opportunity, as Claire said, for questions. So firstly, this is me as an undergraduate. And I was reflecting on when did my interest in research begin? And, and talking to a colleague about this. So as an undergraduate, I was sitting in a lecture given by Alison Richardson, who's now professor at Southampton in cancer nursing. And she gave a very detailed lecture on the presentation of cancer for older adults and presented some very interesting data on how older adults in England on the whole presented late with cancer, so presented with quite an advanced stage of cancer, and a high proportion of them also presented in the emergency department. And I was like, gosh, that's really quite shocking. And then what shocked me more was that our figures were far worse than other European countries, so equivalent sort of economic status and healthcare provision. And as an undergraduate, taking the courage to raise my hand and ask Alison, why? Why were people presenting so late? And she said that they didn't know. So she presented, I think it was about 20 years of data of observing the problem of late presentation. But nobody had asked, why did people present late? Nobody was asking, well, how can we improve this problem that we're observing? What we're focusing on is understanding the problem very well, but not really in identifying any solutions. And that for me was what then stimulated my interest in research, that I saw research as a way to questioning practice and a way to using generating knowledge to address what I felt was a huge inequity or inequality in the way that we were providing healthcare. And for me at that point as an undergraduate, it began to stimulate that interest in healthcare for older people. And that is a theme that I have pursued from undergraduate to my position now as a, a reader, and also my interest in older adults with serious illness. And also importantly, even as an undergraduate, is to then seek opportunities to publish. So I was able to publish my undergraduate dissertation 
um, as a book chapter in a book that um, Alison was the editor. So using those sort of opportunities, building networks, but already beginning to demonstrate my ability to ask important questions, to undertake a research study and to be able to write for publication. And I think that's something that has always remained with me throughout my career. And just as Kathy was saying about the importance of, of publishing throughout your career pathway. And then for me, that, that as a, a, a clinician, I then worked as a district nurse and a health visitor. And I was still very interested in the research. So at this point, I was a graduate, but I could again see that research was a way of improving clinical care. So in my clinical role was very much seeking opportunities to question clinical practice. So to be curious, looking for opportunities to innovate within clinical care and trying to understand how I could be evaluating those innovations. And this then led to a piece of work looking at um, resource allocation in health visiting. So as often happens in clinical practice, there's opportunities to join steering groups, to be contributing to how we are developing our practice and questioning our practice. And that then led to a publication and this time my first publication in a journal. And as so often as people to begin is I published in a professional journal. So in the Nursing Times and then had a, a, a conference presentation at the Royal College of Nursing. So I'm beginning in those small, manageable, but important steps as to how do you start as a, a, a graduate working clinically. And I think also at this point was about building collaborations and networks. So both internally within my NHS organization and also externally working with colleagues at UCL where there was a department of primary care. So making those networks and establishing those relationships. And then as a postgraduate taught, so this was my master's. So at this point, I was already quite clear in my mind that I wanted to continue to pursue delivery of healthcare for older people in the community. So then undertaking an MSc in gerontology. So you can see already that in building that um, portfolio of research and interests and publications around my area of, of healthcare for older people. And just as um, Kathy was saying about asking the priority research questions and that those are very much driven by patients, by our clinical knowledge about what's important, what are the gaps, what things do we struggle with, consulting with patient and public involvement members. So being in a clinical role positions you very well to be able to understand what things do not work as well? What are the gaps in clinical care that actually undertaking research would help us to develop the evidence base and improve the way we provide our care and services? So then having had that undergraduate, postgraduate experience, I then embarked on the, the, the journey then to doctoral funding. And then this slide just details my fellowship experiences of how that began at doctoral level. So for me, my uh, doctoral application predates the NIHR, so it was funded by the Department of Health. Um, and importantly is that I had two attempts to secure doctoral funding, my doctoral fellowship. And the first attempt I got through to interview stage and what I learned at that point was two things, one of which was that if you get through to interview, it means that your fellowship application is meeting the requirements. So you're basically probably fundable on paper and that the interview is very much for you to demonstrate your ability to deliver. And for me, in for my first interview, fellowship interview, was that I was not really sufficiently prepared to compete at a national level. So I'd had opportunities with my supervisors for mock interviews, talking to colleagues who'd been through the process, but I was, if anything, quite flawed by the level of competition at a national level and going into an interview panel with 12 people, being interviewed for 40 minutes was 
very challenging really. So my second attempt was better prepared for the interview and was successful. And then I've then been able to secure using that doctoral fellowship, publishing from that to then secure a clinical lectureship, which I secured in at the first attempt and then using that clinical lectureship as a springboard to then lead to my senior clinical lectureship. And what's important with those two lectureship applications is that these have always been as a joint post between Sussex Community and King's College London, because what it was able to demonstrate was that we were building on a successful partnership. So again, establishing those networks, building those partnerships and using those as springboards to, for progression. And also on the slide, it then shows my experience as a supervisor that obviously as you progress in your clinical academic career, you then have opportunity to be supporting, uh, nurturing the next generation of leaders in nursing, in palliative care, in physiotherapy. And those details that uh, some of the um, applications that I've supported that have been successful. And just to point out, this slide details the integrated clinical academic program that the NIHR offer. They obviously have other uh, programs as well. So for example, for uh, medical doctors and dentists, this is a program that is very much aimed at uh, non-medical. So um, AHPs, nurses, psychologists, pharmacists, paramedics, social care staff. And then what this, um, and then what I'm going to do now is just talk through a little bit more about some of my experience of these different uh, of going through fellowship applications and some of my top tips. So I think firstly is just to appreciate that the fellowship application it is a project and that there is a lot of discussion about that the investment is in the person in in you it is a personal award the caliber of the project the place where it's been hosted, the, the, the training plan and the budget, the value for money. And you can see that this has five elements to it. These five elements are all equally weighted within the application process. So it's absolutely essential to give attention equally to each component. So as I was presenting my undergraduate and postgraduate work, uh, implying for doctoral funding, you want to have um, to be strengthening your CV to be showing that yes you've been submitting work to say a professional conference that your project idea is a good one that you can clearly demonstrate why it's important you're clearly demonstrating from patient and public involvement that your work research matters to those who you're intending to benefit and also importantly to think carefully about your host organizations so for me, my partnership, my joint post began in 2011. So we've been working together for the last 10 years. And I think for me at that beginning of my clinical lectureship that there was a lot of time and thought went into where am I gonna be located? There was a lot of time and thought in setting up how that partnership could work successfully. And then I think importantly is to not underestimate the time required to work up and submit a fellowship application. You're probably looking at a minimum of six months. Most people probably start at least a year in advance in thinking through their ideas, identifying mentors and advisors, and, and working up their research, and their research ideas. And one of the key components is, of course, um, the project. And in fellowship applications, it's often quite smart that it is a clear and simple idea, that remembering that you are interviewed, the panel comprises at least 12 individuals who will all be very much focused on their respective specialties. So it's essential to be able to communicate your idea that can be understood across specialties, being careful about avoiding jargon and being ensuring that you are articulating why this is important very much that it's achievable within the resources that you have, methodologically sound, that you've got robust methods that you've clearly detailed. And then also thinking about what might be the risks to your project and to your fellowship and what contingency plans have you put in place. 
And finally, the NIHR are always looking for what is going to be the impact in the next five years. What difference will your work make? So thinking about from the perspective of patients, from the NHS and health and social care, what difference will it make that you undertake this research? So one of the key things I think in success as a uh, in research and as a clinical academic are your colleagues. So internally, externally, clinically and academically. So those supervisors and mentors that work alongside you and who are your go-to individuals, your sounding boards, your critical friends. And this slide details some of mine. So these individuals all work with me currently on my senior clinical lectureship. Some of them work with me on my clinical lectureship. And it has a mix of individuals like Chris Norton, who sits in the middle, who when I was applying for a senior clinical lectureship, that I was very much, a, a tip I was given was to look to somebody who I wanted to look like. And Chris Norton at that point was a clinical academic. She was heading up nursing research at Imperial and was a professor of nursing at King's. And then the other colleagues are individuals with expertise in my field. So Claire Goodman, uh, the second one is uh, in community nursing and in care homes, Subi Banerjee from dementia and Irene Higginson from palliative care. And then Donna Lamb over here on the far right is my current chief nurse at Sussex Community. And then also the NIHR has an amazing infrastructure system to support individuals to pursue clinical academic careers. And what we have to remember is that they are very much wanting more clinicians to be moving into research. It is very much part of everybody's clinical practice and key to successful research is that there are more clinicians who are leading that research. So they have invested in really quite a substantial infrastructure to make that happen. And some of these things locally for us, we now have an ARC, an Applied Research Collaborative for Kent, Surrey and Sussex, really important resource for both doctoral funding and also for supporting a transition from postdoc to independent career, uh, independent researcher. So just very briefly in thinking about my research work, so my research field is important to think about this as an individual, particularly as you progress. So my USP is about transforming community care. So in fellowship applications, you want to be thinking through what is my universal selling point? What is it that I offer that others might not? So what makes me stand out in that very, very competitive national field? And that for me, that my um, research practice is very much about integrating research with clinical practice and with education and with leadership. And the focus of my work is around addressing inequalities in palliative care for older adults. So a theme, as I showed, that I developed as an undergraduate and have pursued throughout my clinical career and throughout my clinical academic career. And this slide just details the research studies that I have undertaken through my um, various fellowships. So beginning as a clinical lectureship in OptCare Elderly, which was about optimizing palliative care for older people in the community. That acted as a springboard to my senior clinical lectureship on focusing on managing clinical uncertainty within community hospitals in intermediate care units with that uncertainty very much driven by frailty and multimorbidity. And those fellowships then acting as a springboard to a large program grant funded by the ESRC, the Economic and Social Research Council on um, palliative care for people with dementia. And then most recently this year, we've opened in January a COVID study looking at the, the delivery of palliative care for older people within care homes. And all the way through this, much of this springboard is about publishing and then promoting to increase the impact and the visibility of the research. So that's some of my publications and some of the impact of that work. 
So just to introduce you to some of, of my work, so some of the things that I'm probably most proud of. So this is my clinical lectureship work. So this I was funded through a clinical lectureship. I was able to use that lectureship to then secure research for patient benefit funding to extend what I was able to do in my lectureship fellowship. And this then was looking at a model of integrating palliative care within community nursing services and within primary care. And this slide just details the um, overview of the intervention that we published in Age and Aging. And then this then details the main outcome of the trial. So this was development work that then led to a, a randomized controlled trial, which has just been published in the International Journal of Nursing Studies. And the work now for me is in promoting uh, this publication and this, this study to impact on clinical care. So the work that I'm leading at the moment, as I said, is around from my senior clinical lectureship, which is around managing clinical uncertainty within intermediate care units or community hospitals. And this is a slide that was just showing uh, one of the underpinning development studies. This again was about developing an intervention. So this was the um, underpinning development work which used a national study to understand nearness of end of life for people who were admitted to a community hospital. And the phone, final component of the study, we've just now been able to open within our community hospitals using evidence-based tools to both assess and manage clinical frailty as a main driver of clinical uncertainty within these care settings. And what those fellowships then have enabled me to do is then move from that feasibility work through to co-leading a programme of research. And just as Cathy described, it's very much you can see this sort of incremental process of moving through very quite discrete research studies, building your um, expertise, demonstrating your ability through publications, through presentations. And that then leads then to larger and more substantial pieces of work. So this is the Embed Care programme, which is a five year programme on the delivery of palliative care for people with dementia in the community. So people at home and in care homes. This slide is just overviewing the six work streams that form the, that form the programme. Um, and then running alongside, most importantly, our patient and public involvement and also our policy and public engagement to increase the impact of the research across the programme. And this is then published within the International Journal of Geriatric Psychiatry, and there's more detail on the programme website. And then all the way through, one of the things that I think is so important to understand is about developing networks and collaborations. So this slide just depicts the co-applicants on the Embed Care program. And one what you can see is the long list of individuals who came together for this program to happen. And also importantly, that very often for successful research teams is that they are multidisciplinary. So again, in those networks and collaborations that you want them to be outside of your disciplines and specialties, and really this opportunity to be working with others to ensure that you have the skills and the resources needed to deliver particularly quite a, a complex program of work. So finally, in thinking about the tips and advice. So as I said, build research expertise, profiles and networks. So within clinical practice, often that begins through things like being a site principal investigator for a research study. It begins through, as mine did, through involvement in quality improvement projects that might well lead to your first publications and project present and conference presentations. Thinking all the time about publications, promoting your work, impact both through uh, professional journals, scientific journals, conferences, writing blogs, tweeting, having a presence on social media. The fellowship applications very much plan ahead. They take a long time to think through and to write well. 
And I think also importantly is to read everything when you are applying for a fellowship. So not only the guidance, but the NIHR publish on their websites the chair's reports from the previous year's applications. They are really insightful to understand what were the strengths of the applications that were submitted and funded, and also what were the weaknesses and the ones that were unsuccessful. And then, as I said at the beginning, is to pursue research questions that are important and to articulate why they are important. So looking to PPI policy, the James Lind Alliance is a very useful resource to understand what might be the uh, priorities for your particular area. If it's in palliative care or mental health, that is an organisation that undertakes very extensive consultations with, in particular, the public. As I said, a robust study design seek advice from others so as Kathy flagged the research design service speak to them talk to them early in your process when you're thinking about the fellowship they're in a very well position to support you throughout looking to your host department and institutions and colleagues and collaborators and I think importantly when you're writing these fellowship over applications is not to overlook your relevant non-research activities so your clinical excellence. So what do you bring as a clinician? So the sorts of things if you're in you know, a senior team leadership position or there's a particular aspect of clinical work that you have led on, those are really important strengths to demonstrate your ability to be a future clinical academic leader. And then finally, just the resources oops, and opportunities. So as I said, the NIHR, want clinicians to be successful in research. So they have invested and are investing heavily for that to happen. And this is some of the resources that are available. So on the NIHR website, they have a great search engine for on career development, which you can look at for your respective disciplines. This is some of the resources that they have posted on that website. Um, they also have invested in, in their incubator um, infrastructure to build capacity. So there's an infra, uh, incubator for nursing that Alison Richardson leads. There's been investment in 70 nurses at 70, again, investment in nursing. And then we have some important local initiatives like the Darcy Fellowships that are available in Kent, Surrey and Sussex, and those are offered annually. And then finally, just to say thank you for listening.